I really feel like I might be able to be a mother, even though, you know, everything I'd sort of seen and read about being a mother after sort of a difficult childhood yeah. was kind of negative, you know, that, that you maybe wouldn't be capable to be a mother or that, you know, a lot of people said, oh, your shadows will come back to, <laughs> to get you and things like that. And it was really alien to us because yeah. we'd only ever been like super, Deeply super... Deeply in love with yeah, each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They'd already sort of been through the... <laughs> The barriers of being like, well, will I be a good mum? I think I'll be a good mum. You know, like other people say I won't. And then all of a sudden I was just not the mum that I want to be for my little boy. Yeah. I guess I'm really lucky that Peter is just an amazing dad. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest is a writer of the many things that she has written. Uh, there are two non-fiction books. The first, Lowborn, was published five years ago. Uh, and the full title is Lowborn, Growing Up, Getting Away and Returning to Britain's poorest towns. That's now been followed up earlier this year with Newborn, running away, breaking from the past, building a new family. She's also the mother of one. It's Kerry Hudson. Hi. Hello. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Like, I've just literally devoured no, Newborn and absolutely loved it. What does it feel like to have this book out there? Because obviously it must feel very different to Lowborn because that's such a... I think, well, both are giving so much of yourself, but this is also the celebration of of life. Yeah, no, I mean, what a lovely way to put it, I think. So um, Lowborn, for I'm sure the, <laughs> any of your readers who didn't miraculously read it, um, is basically the telling of, of what it means to grow up poor in the UK. So it documents... Uh, my experience growing up, which was really on, I guess, the sharpest edge of poverty and yeah. deprivation. Um, there was a lot of trauma. And so it was really exploring the sort of the impact and the consequences of what it means for children growing up in poverty in the UK mm. and the the many sort of factors that are involved in that. Um, and so Newborn was really about the the joy of being a mother. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a lot of people when I, when Lowborn came out, kind of the the, the end of Lowborn, no spoilers, I don't think, <laughs> is um, is me talking about how I really feel like I might be able to be a mother, even though, you know, everything I'd sort of seen and read about have, being a mother after sort of a difficult childhood yeah. was kind of negative, you know, that, that you maybe wouldn't be capable to be a mother or um, that, you know, a lot of people said, oh, your shadows will come back to, <laughs> to get you and things like that. Um, and so, so Newborn was really about me trying to show how the way that I'd grown up actually really made motherhood so much more joyful for me. But also I think it made me a much better mother. I wanted to show that sort of the all the capabilities that you can have if you come from a more difficult background and then you decide to to become a mother. Yeah. Let's talk about your childhood because this is obviously a, a sort of a good segue into that. You grew up in Glasgow. It was a very difficult childhood to say the least. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, um, I mean, it's hard to, I have a little, almost like a little shopping list at the front of Lowborn where I list everything that happened to me before I was 18. Um, and really, they're enough for anyone to go through before the age of 80, really. Um, and I had them sort of all packed into those first 18 years. Um, but yeah, so my family were frequently homeless. We lived in um, halfway houses. I'm care experienced. Um, unfortunately, both my parents had pretty severe mental health problems, mm. um, which were never fully addressed. So we lived with that as well. Um, and then there were all the things that come from just growing up in a sort of, um, you know, in in a poor environment where there are unfortunately a lot of social problems. So uh, sexual violence and substance abuse and um, the, the things that, that unfortunately are symptomatic of, of an unequal society, if you like. Um, so it was really, you know, it was, I... I, you know, I think if it's your childhood, you're like, yeah. well, it was just the the joke, <laughs> the joke in our house is that whenever I've got a childhood anecdote, I'm like, isn't this funny? And everyone's like, oh, my God, that is horrifying. And I'm like, no, no, look, it's funny. Um, so it took me a long time to realise that it, in fact, was not that funny, yeah. even though there was, you know, a lot of laughter and a lot of warmth and a lot of love, actually, uh, where I grew up. The truth is that kids growing up in those environments often go through an awful lot and in other environments too but but more so for obvious reasons it, it's amazing you can that you highlight the fact that there was laughter within it as well yeah and you know and so one of the reasons that I wrote Lowborn was because 
I I was really afraid of becoming sort of a, a poster girl yeah. <laughs> for social mobility. You know, I left school at 15 without any GCSEs. Um, and, you know, I'd somehow managed to become, I was, I was then a project manager for national charities, mm-hmm. um, a children's charity. And then I became, uh, you know, an author. And my first book was... I think it's fair to say, like, really successful. I was up for a lot of awards. And so everyone's like, well, look, like, she's done it. She can pull herself up by her bootstraps. <laughs> and what I was trying to say with Lowborn was that actually there were so many young people who had who were just as smart, smarter than I was, funnier than I was, sparkier than I was. Um, they had all this, like, sort of pent-up potential, but they never got to realise it because actually, you know, I was lucky and mm-hmm. they weren't. And that is actually the reason. Um, and so I guess with Lowborn, what I was trying to do was show that um, those those places have just as much potential. You know, those young people have just as much potential. Um, and so one of the reasons I wrote Lowborn was to really explore why my path differed and how it differed and also how things are now for those young people growing up in the the many places across the UK that I grew up in. I mean, there's just so much potential in so many places and there's so many different voices that we do need to try and get to and we need to be able to hear, you know, because that's only when we really see what life is like around the UK. And there's so much, I think everyone has something to offer, but they've got to be given the opportunity to offer that. Of course. I mean, one of my least favourite phrases in sort of arts, you know, arts outreach is um, hard to reach area. <laughs> so I was like, get on a bus, guys. The 82 goes right there and it costs a pound 50. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and so I think that's a lot of uh, another reason why I wrote Lowborn was really because I saw a lot of media being presented about poorer communities or working class communities or especially working class women yeah. that were so poorly representative of what I knew to be the truth and that was often because people with very little experience were parachuting into these communities with all their preconceptions built from all the media <laughs> that had happened before mm-hmm. and then um and then coming back and just perpetuating all of those all of those sort of you know um misinterpretations of communities and so I really wanted to as much as possible um offer what I had to offer at that time, um, which was just after Brexit, when there was a lot of division in Mm -hmm. the UK, as unfortunately there still is, um, was to offer my authentic experience, you know, and my authentic. um, And also, you know, I had, albeit a very small platform, but I had a platform to be able to say something and that felt valuable in the moment. Yeah. What did family mean to you back then? I mean, I kind of had a chosen family, Mm -hmm. you know, like I have a really... Um, I'm estranged from my from my mother and my father, yeah. um, which is really sad and probably a longer podcast for another time, <laughs> but it does happen. And I think is often one of the reasons I wrote about that in both books is because it's still, you know, really a taboo, I think, in many yeah. cases. Um, but for me, I have my chosen family. So I had like, you know, my best friend who's been my friend for decades and her kids who are my god kids. And she's, you know, and, you know, all of my, you know, my friends who I think you I love the term chosen family because yeah. I think it allows you to um, have have boundaries, you know, with what what you think is acceptable, what you don't, what you will give to a relationship, what you ask to have back, um, and so and then obviously, of course, I met my I met my partner, and that changed it again because well, also with a chosen family, you get to really assess how someone is making you feel, and kind of, you know, and I guess that is a boundary actually, kind of going well, no, that's you've cr- you've crossed the line there, you know. Whereas with a family, you can often feel like no, this is my family, this is we just we stick together because that's blood, and actually that's that can be really detrimental on so many levels, just sticking at it because it's family. I mean, it can be, you know, I mean, it's it's so, I, I say this about every decision I've ever made and certainly every decision I've ever written about, that it's so personal and yeah. subjective, you know. Um, but for me, I think, yeah, that the term blood is thicker than water is so, so dangerous, you know, because it allows all sorts of things to happen that you just should never allow to happen. Whereas I, I, I guess I really got to, yeah, like establish my boundaries, decide what was acceptable to me and what wasn't yeah. and invite people who who I felt loved and supported me and who accepted my love and support equally. Yeah. Um, so I felt, I mean, I, by the time I'd written Lowborn, um, which was, I guess, seven years ago now, if it was published five years ago, I was in a, a very, like, sort of healthy place. I'd 
met my partner who I was deeply in love with, still am, but just to, <laughs> just to clarify. And, um, you know, I'd had like a lot of therapy, a lot of counselling. I'd, you know, I built a really lovely life for myself full of good people and good things. And I guess that's so important to have that in place before you start talking about these things. Because otherwise you're just constantly opening up this wound. Yeah, I mean, it was it was still really hard. You know, like the people often said to me, like, how did you get through writing this? And I was like, well, the first thing I did was got myself a really good therapist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like immediately. Um, but I really, you know, I really, the, people often ask me, like, how do I write about, you know, this trauma in my life or this thing that's happened? Or, you know, I'm really, I really want to write about it. But I'm, and I always say, like, unless you feel you're absolutely in the strongest place possible, yeah. um, just, just don't, you know, like, you know, really work on all those things and then when you're ready to put pen to paper you'll know because it yeah. won't be quite as terrifying as it might be otherwise yeah when it came to obviously because you had such a problematic relationship with your own mum mm-hmm. did you look ahead to the future and think of maybe one day you could be a mum or did was the idea of it just such an abstract thought because that wasn't modeled in your own life yeah I mean I definitely I was I was 36 when I met my my husband. Mm. Um, I'd had a relationship for 10 years with a woman before that. So um, obviously that just makes, you know, deciding to have children just more practically complicated yeah. as well as anything else. And I definitely, I had like an ambiguity, I think, about being a mum. I was definitely not like, I have to be a mother. You know, while all my friends were freezing their eggs, I was... Yeah you know, out in Shoreditch, in basement <laughs> clubs, having a great time, spending all my money on tequila shots and not egg freezing. Um, but um, but when I met my partner, I was like, actually, I really feel Although like... you had a conversation early on. With, very with early husband, on with my husband. Where you were like, I don't want kids. And he was like, all right. Yeah, no, we were we were walking like maybe maybe like 15 minutes away in a park, actually. And I was like, you know, and we just saw a cute little kid. And, you know, I like children. I love yeah. my God kids. I was re- I was a really, you know, hands on involved God mum. And um, and I was like, you know, do you think you want children? And he's like, no, not really. And I was like, well, OK, me neither, probably. And that that was kind of it, you know. Um, but I think that what I started to realise was, I, A, I think as I got m- more sure of who I was yeah. and I became more certain that I wasn't going to like replicate the mistakes that I'd made and I could start to see the value of what I'd been through and how much it shaped and strengthened me as a person that actually rather than be this sort of like terrible curse over motherhood yeah. for me, it might actually be this incredible resource that I could draw on for for the things that I knew, you know, my friends found difficult about motherhood. Yeah. Um, and so, so then I was like, actually, I really think this is something that I could do and I want to do. Um, but by then I was... 37, right. I guess. So I'd really left it like right to the, which is honestly, that's just my whole professional <laughs> life, <laughs> right up to the deadline, you know, not a minute before. Um, so, and then it took us like two years to get pregnant. So I had definitely had a period where I was like, if this doesn't happen, what does my life look like, you know? Um, There's a part in the book where you, you say you not falling pregnant almost felt like a punishment for all that had come before. And I, my, like my heart just went out and I know I know reading the book that you do fall pregnant that you do have a son but the thought the thought of you feeling like that at the time like it's such a heartbreaking thought that you know your childhood was not your fault and you know the thought that this is a punishment you're not being able to have your own kids you know it's so heartbreaking to feel like to, to know that that's where you were I mean, I don't think that's an uncommon feeling for, yeah. for women who face infertility, you know. And, you know, I am, I was, you know, A, I'd, I'd like spent a lot of, you know, sort of my mid-20s to my mid-30s thinking about motherhood and watching my friends do very wise things and very rash things <laughs> around <laughs> around parenthood and marriage and things. Um, and so it wasn't that I, you know, I wasn't rational about it, but there's just a part of you, it's, you know, it's sewn into like the sort of fabric of society that you're like, you're a woman and if... If your body fails you somehow, you know, I, I felt like a failure. Yeah. I really did, you know. And that was, and also I think, I don't know, I just, I kind of just assumed that as soon as I decided, then the universe would <laughs> give me a child, you know. <laughs> and actually, you know, I was like, oh, well, this is, this is a bit of a surprise. Um, So it was, it was tough to be honest. And also I think what was probably most complicated about it was that it, it, paired exactly with me promoting Lowborn. Right. So I was going on stage pretty much every night. I did like a, a hundred gigs in a year pretty much for the wow. publication of, you know, um, going on stage every single night talking about my childhood trauma and poverty and speaking to people, which is such a privilege who'd mm-hmm. also been through trauma or difficult times. And then also doing this like 
really huge thing personally. Yeah. So I think I think I made it much more complicated but for myself. But obviously, you do not get to choose the timing if you no. decide to have your child at 38. So um, so when I did get pregnant, completely unexpectedly. Well, that's was, the thing. So you'd kind of just thought that's not going to Oh, for sure. Happen. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really, we knew there was nothing. It was, you know, it was unexplained infertility. So we'd had all the tests and stuff. Um, but, um, but yeah, but so basically we decided it was going to happen. I was like, well, what am I going to get then? <laughs> you know, that was yeah. kind of like, what's my life going to be like now? And so we decided to move to Prague for a while because it's a... Why Prague? Just, it's a beautiful place. We'd yeah. lived, we'd spent like a month there before a few years back. And it's just, it's just beautiful and easy and... You know, it's kind of, I don't know. I mean, we just we just love it. And we weren't planning to stay that long. You know, it was meant to be like a few months and then we'd move on somewhere else. And that was kind of, that was my payoff. You know, martinis and frequent travel was my payoff for, <laughs> for not being a mother. Um, but then we got there and I guess, it, honestly, if I had a, a pound for every time someone told me to just relax and I wanted to throttle them. But it turns out I did, in fact, just need to relax. I just needed a few more martinis. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, so then I um so so then I fell pregnant really unexpectedly. Can you remember when like when you did the test or what the symptoms were leading up to you doing the test? Do you know I'd had I'd had so many months where I was like that was definitely a cramp. That was definitely a yeah. cramp or you know like oh this feels weird or I'm a little bit hot and cold. I'd done you know I'd spent just so many hours on mum's net mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that I cannot 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 recommend at all yeah. but um and so I just knew that I didn't feel quite right, right you know and I was like you know just to take my mind off I was so certain that I wasn't going to be but I was like you know there's always that sort of inkling of hope every month and so um you know I went to the the Czech pharmacy and I held up my Google Translate to order my, <laughs> my pregnancy <laughs> test and then we did it in we were staying in like a, a tiny little Airbnb flat like just a temporary flat in our like tiny little bathroom and we just and you know but it was it was beautiful I remember just like I think I just like sort of laughed and cried alternately for like 40 hours <laughs> I was like, are you okay? Are you ready for motherhood? Because this is... <laughs> well, it must have felt like such a surreal thing to know that you're, you're pregnant, but you're also in a foreign country where people don't speak English, you know, and, and, and then two days later, lockdown happens. Yeah, and, then, and it was a very heavy lockdown in Prague as well. So they had like, you know, soldiers on the streets, you had to carry your passport. The fine for not obeying lockdown rules was, and they were really strict, um, the fine for not obeying was the price of a, an apartment in Prague. Like it wasn't like, you know, 50 quid and a slap on the wrist. So it was really and also we couldn't understand anything. It was all in Czech. So thank goodness uh, a lovely BBC journalist based in Prague set up a group to help us kind of understand the information. But it was so precarious. And after all those years where we'd been settled and comfortable and around our friends and family (laughs) and without a global pandemic, all of a sudden that was, you know, when pregnancy happened. Well, one thing you do talk about is um, the concern and the apprehension about things changing. For like you and Peter, you've set up this gorgeous marriage by this point. You know, you're traveling the world. You're able to just do whatever you fancy. And all of a sudden there's this worry between you both that actually it's going to change. The focus is going to change. Your mobility is going to change. Uh, yeah, and you know, I always, I, I always, we went to like there's a, a lovely independent cinema called Bioko that we used to go to and have a coffee, and it was you know very chic and European, and we sat and drank our coffees, and I was like, you know, don't worry, we're us. It's not going to change. It's us. It's other people change. I've seen it, but not us. At the hubris, you know? like, the idiocy. Like, of course, everything's going to change. Um, but and so that was, you know, I was definitely, I think, in denial about how much things would change for with, with having um, a baby. And Peter, my husband, was definitely very aware, which is, I think, actually probably <laughs> like just our natural sort of, you know, <laughs> You're positions. Hitting the sand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we kind of meet in the middle and that's how it works. But um, so, yeah, I mean, we were very, and I, I really underestimated how much our relationship would change. And that's a hard thing, isn't it? When you're going through something that's so massive and so wanted, but it's such a common thing for for at least one partner to kind of have that, have that worry and have that concern. So I think it's amazing that you touch on it in the book because it is such a common thing. But in, in I think maybe people sometimes feel like if they were to verbalise it, then they'd somehow seem ungrateful for, for, for the life that they're bringing into the world, for the fact that they've been able to, to have a baby. But it's, it's so common. 
I think so. And also that, that it's going to change your marriage. I mean, I'd seen it, but I hadn't really seen many people speak about the fact. I mean, I really, I cannot stress how disgustingly in love me and my husband were either. <laughs> like it was, you know, it was genuinely revolting. I just love the fact that you were <laughs> friends first for a long time and you basically friend zoned each other. Yeah, no, I mean, really, really for like, I think in three months, we sort of walked around East London, like having coffees and like, you know, but it was beautiful you know and then when we when we we decided to get together it was we were just instantly together it was gorgeous for sure like it was it was I was expecting sleepless nights and <laughs> you know like not to recognize my own body and yeah. you know a, a c-section scar that I you know that I was always slightly worried about but I was not expecting like it to have such a big impact on our marriage for sure yeah talking about your body because you you describe it in the book pre- uh, pre-pregnancy, you describe your body as a coat, an ugly coat you can never take off. How did your relationship with your body change during pregnancy or did it change? Oh, I mean, it changed completely. I really, I got my husband to, boyfriends of Instagram, I got my husband <laughs> to take me at like a bump picture every yeah. week and I let him take the whole thing and I like, and you know, the bigger I was, the prouder I was, you know. And <laughs> Isn't I, that such a glo- like, yeah. it's such an amazing <laughs> thing that, you know, growing up we're told, no, be tiny, be tiny, be tiny. And then when you're growing a human, you're like, yes, this is my body. Yeah, I was like, look, I'm massive, I'm huge, you know. And I, But I really... It, it helped me reflect a lot on all the messages that I told myself. Yep. I mean, to be fair, like I was a child of the 90s, you know, yeah. it was like Kate Moss yeah. and, you know, Britney Spears with mm-hmm. like a tiny little bit of belly fat being told she shouldn't be on stage. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it, the messages of the 90s were so harmful. And mm-hmm. I think anyone who grew up in sort of the 90s with any sort of body image um, issues, uh, you know, really... We know why. Yeah, we, yeah, we felt the brunt of it, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it really helped me, like... And also, I thought about my body in a different way, you know. It suddenly wasn't about, like, it's, you know, um, whether it was a beauty ideal or whether I l- looked like the, the women I saw around me who were being represented as the, the beauty ideal. But actually, it was just this amazing thing growing. And I was just so interested in it, you know. I was yeah. interested in it. Like, this is just wild, you know. I called myself like a, a meaty Russian doll, you know. I kept thinking of it. It's just like stacked inside of each other. I just loved it. I just I love that. <laughs> I really, I just I just loved being pregnant. I really did. Um, even though it like, wasn't at all simple, I just... Well, what was it like going through all the appointments and uh, things like that not only just during covid but also in a hospital in a, in a hospital that you don't know but also in a language that you don't know like what was that experience because it must have been quite daunting especially when your husband can't go with you to some of the appointments i mean trying to go through your your pregnancy your precious precious pregnancy that you've like waited for years yeah. for by by holding up Google Translate and saying my waters have broken <laughs> at the door that you think you're meant to be at is pretty is 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 pretty alarming. I was really lucky that even though so much of it was you know Kafkaesque almost, you know, go to this door, go to this door, go to this door. I mean just sort of waddling around, you know, with my huge belly around these huge hospital complexes. Um but you know the benefit was that actually like people were so kind and so yeah. open and so warm. So I feel like I was very lucky. And actually my maternity care was, I have to say, exemplary. Really? I mean like yeah, they had um 24 hour uh, breastfeeding care for instance they have you in for seven days there if you choose to Mm -hmm. uh, because they literally show you how to do everything they teach you how to bathe your baby they teach you how to do a nappy they keep an eye on you they let you sleep you know like all those things so it was really and it was it was all that must be such a comforting thing because I feel like if I remember back to having my first they did help me give him his first bath but so much of it felt like I should know it mm-hmm. like I should instinctively as a mother know how to do everything where well, the, the truth is you don't and babies newborn babies don't feel like any other baby that you've ever held before no no totally yeah no it was really well funnily enough I'd I thought that I was going to leave after two or three days right? because we had a really great paediatrician who was just up the street from us. Um, and so that would have all been fine. But then after <laughs> the baby, I was like, oh, no, I'm staying. <laughs> I will stay as long as I can humanly. <laughs> and the only thing that got me out, actually, in the end, they let me leave after five days, I think. And the reason they let me go um, was because, unfortunately, they were having another sort of uh. rise in COVID cases. But also because my husband had been, he couldn't come and visit at the ward so he'd been coming and standing downstairs at the Aww. window outside at night times. And I'd hold up her baby. It's cute. No, it's like a sort of 80s Brat Pack yeah. film scene. <laughs> but without a ghetto blaster, it was just me holding up the baby. Um, and so I, that was actually really precious as well, you know. Yeah. Like, But I really wanted, 
I really wanted the whole family be to, to be together. Like, you know, that's just like such a such a sort of, you know, uh, visceral feeling. Yeah. You need your family to be together. So how did you feel heading towards the birth? Was that something that you were worried about? I d- had unexplained infertility. I got gestational diabetes. I, I felt like my body had not really played ball the whole time. Yeah. So it felt, it, you know, I felt nervous. You know, like, like I say, I left school at 15. So I literally... I've always educated myself, like, you know, through reading whatever is at hand and as much as possible of it. Um, In this case, I I do not (laughs) recommend it. Um, But it did mean that I was really sure about... So I decided to have um, an elective Mm C-section. And I did that because because it was the pandemic, because I was doing it in a country where I didn't speak the language. And also because I couldn't have a doula or my husband there to advocate for me. So I was really like, I need this to be as safe as it possibly can be with a language barrier and all the other sort of factors involved. And a bit more of a controlled environment. Yeah, exactly. I wanted it just to be, basically my my hope was that it would be as safe as possible for me and the baby. Um, and um, so I'm glad I did that because actually I had like really a, a wonderful birth. Like it was so moving and so beautiful. And, um, you know, and I, I wasn't actually afraid like until... Yeah literally until I got in and they started swathing me with the iodine and then I was like oh yeah this is this is going to happen and it might be, be frightening it's a really surreal moment as well <laughs> just something like that it's happening right now yeah no <laughs> you're like oh this is this is unusual um, but no it was so I'm really glad that I did that but I think potentially had I not done all that like masses and masses of research maybe I would have made different decisions. I don't yeah. know, you know. Um, but I, I love my birth, you know, and I got my beautiful, healthy boy at the end of it. Exactly that. And, you know, and and both you and him are happy and healthy and that's all you can ever wish for. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Do you remember meeting him for the first time? Oh, my God, yeah, it was astounding. It was just, it was so beautiful. They, like, laid me in his arms and he had a little pointy elfin chin, mm-hmm. which he no longer has. He has, like, a little pudding now. But uh, he had a little elfin chin. And I just looked at it and it was the funniest thing. One of my friends had said to me, like, don't be surprised if you don't recognise your baby or, you know. And I was like, oh, OK. But I just looked at him and I was like, of course, of course it's you. Of course it's you. I've been hanging out <laughs> for, like, 40 weeks. And it was just, it was, it was just perfect. Like, I really... I I didn't expect to have that instant connection because basically I've been told so often not to expect it, but it was just instantly there and it was it was it was just magic, you know. It was well, was that a thing that you were worried about? I mean, you know, leading. I know that you wanted to wanted a baby, you wanted to get pregnant, but once you were actually pregnant, was the thought of those voices that had come before? Did that enter your head at all during your pregnancy? before meeting him I mean inevitably right like I mean you'll always listen to the 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 things that are like most negative about you or the the most negative inference you know um so none of my none of my close and lovely friends saying you're going to be an amazing mum like (laughs) chill out you know the people that actually know yeah only the stranger who wrote the Amazon review saying that I should never have a child (laughs) was the one who I gave credence to so no for sure it did um I think so I had a moment in the the hospital where basically I decided to have him in with me for the first night all the way through the night. Yeah. Um, Because they keep babies who've had, um, whose mums have had a C-section in ICU for... for uh, so that you can rest. NICU. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was like, no, actually, I really want my baby to be with me. And um, and I was doing it and I was like, oh, no, this is, this is going to be fine. Like, I was terrified for sure. But I was like, you know, and then I was thinking about like, you know, I have a little sister who I pretty much, you know, raised so yeah. often during my childhood. I've worked with kids for years. I love my God kids. They love me. I was like, why on earth was I listening to everyone else when, you know, my own sort of maternal instincts are obviously so clear, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that was a lovely moment. And, you know, I didn't sleep, but it was, I really, I treasure those early days. Like they were just beautiful. Oh, second night though. Did you let yourself rest? Do you know what? I wasn't very good at it, but do you know, I wasn't very good at it when I was alone by myself in the really? hospital. Really? Did you feel just safer when he was with you? Well, I just had him next to me all the time, yeah. you know, and so I <laughs> I had like a, a little playlist that I had for birth, which was like Bjorg and John Coltrane. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just, it, he loved it. He was like, his little eyes lit up every time I played any music. So I'd least to lie very still and listen to that. But then as soon as I got home to Peter, I was like, I basically just like melted into the floorboards. <laughs> he like put me into bed and he took the baby and he brought me a bunch of, um, Was it easier to rest there and to relax rather than at the hospital? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I think I just, 
I I just knew it was just me and him, you yeah. know? And that's the thing, like, I didn't have, I really didn't have, and also I had a private room, which was wonderful. It was, like, £20 a night, and it gave us loads of time just to be just the two of us. Um, but obviously I wasn't speaking to anyone yeah. in my native tongue either. So it was, it was really just the two of us, and I just really wanted to always make sure that he was okay. Yeah. And it also just had a C-section. So, you know, like, I was myself recovering from a pretty major surgery um, but as soon as I knew I could hand over the reins to Peter I was just <laughs> like that's it I'm just, <laughs> just some chocolate in my mouth and you know <laughs> let me sleep for 10 hours <laughs> how was your recovery it was good actually yeah. you know like I read I read a lot beforehand so you know the 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 biggest thing they say is like get up get moving get up get mm. moving and so I you know I did the they call it the c-section shuffle I did that all around the wards they give you I don't know if it's the same in the UK but in Prague they give you these like little sort of trolleys to put your baby in that you right. sort of walk around with <laughs> so you're walking around like this sort of weird supermarket with your little trolley with your baby <laughs> and then you know <laughs> and then you so I did that a lot and and then I was just, I was just really, I was just really active, I think. Mm. And then also I was working still. So um, I didn't really take a maternity leave. So I was working on a pilot script for Sky at yeah. the time. And so I'd like prop myself up with all the pillows. Uh, but that was actually amazing because it allowed me to immediately connect with the, the person I was before I was a mother mm -hmm. and who I would still be as a mother. But it's very easy to lose that, I think, in those those early few months where you're so consumed by motherhood. So I was very lucky, I think, that I had a good recovery and I also felt really purposeful and sort of happy during those early days. Yeah. Do you feel like mothering your child helped you mother your younger self in some way? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, in fact, there's a term for it, which is called remothering, which is about if you have not had the best experience of mothering yourself, um, sort of, you know, mending those mending those wounds through giving your child like all the things that you never had and watching them take that love and have those experiences and be nourished and nurtured, nurtured in that way. Um, my little boy is literally the happiest little boy in the world I mean he's just quite ridiculous to be honest but like you know like everyone says like he is just such a happy chappy like this is you know and I'm like I know I know and it's 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 magical you know like it's really it's really really special to be able to to redo things and one of the things that the book is about really is about how a lot of what my childhood showed me was not just you know what I would like to do as a mother but all the things that I didn't want to do all the yeah. things that I knew you know, had actually harmed me quite a lot and how to not replicate those in my son's life. Um, and also, of course, made me like, you know, much more resilient, which mm -hmm. obviously came in handy over the next few years and uh, made me much more resilient and made me, you know, kind of less of an anxious mother in many ways. Really? I did not sweat the small stuff, you know, like I definitely worried about the big stuff. But the small stuff, I was like, we don't have to worry about this. Like, he's safe, he's happy, he's in a beautiful home. Like, you know, it, the cupboards are full. He's really loved. Everything is okay. Um, so, yeah, a lot of my upbringing, I guess, informed the decisions that I decided to make or maybe interrogate them more, I guess, as well. Yeah. You know, like, I wasn't just blindly going through, you know, what I felt um, was the right thing or what I'd learned as a blueprint from my own mother. Mm -hmm. I was literally interrogating every decision we made with my husband um, to try and make good decisions, which I think made a difference too. It must be a difficult thing to mother when you haven't seen that. Well, I guess you would have seen mothers around you, but you haven't experienced that mothering yeah. yourself. And to, to give my mum credit for many, many, many sort of issues yeah. that, that existed in my childhood she did love me you know and she did she did so I did see that model of love it's yeah. just that it was so much more complex and flawed than I think a, a child needs to grow up with yeah um so but I mean I think that's what I thought I thought you know I've got no blueprint like I've never how do you learn and then I was like oh you just you meet your child and you love them yeah and you you work the rest out yeah. <laughs> you know um and so that's what we did you know and you know like um I always say when when the book came out and they were like, are you happy to do like, parenting, parenting podcasts and, you know, write for parenting magazines? I was like, sure, but I'm going to tell everyone I don't know anything. I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, and I stand by that. But um, but I feel like definitely my background allowed me to have a different perspective yeah. and a positive one, actually, which I wasn't expecting because so many people have told me that my background, my childhood would negatively impact my ability to be a mother. 
And you're like, absolutely not. Yeah. (laughs) One thing you have said, actually, that I absolutely loved is the fact that you say that childhood, it should be something that's cushioned. It should be sheltered. It should just be full of love. They shouldn't have to contend with all these other things that they have a lifetime ahead of them to experience. You know, it should just be love. Yeah. I mean, I really, I feel so, and I mean, you know, when I said that, it was actually an interview for The Observer and the interviewer, who was wonderful, said, you know, aren't you worried he's going to get like, you know, you know, a little bit cushioned, a bit soft, you know, he's not going to have resilience. And I was like, why does a child have to have resilience? No, yeah. like they should feel secure and loved. And Also, happy. life happens, right? So there's well, always going to be something. And you know that that's coming somewhere. So, but So before that happens, let them be cushioned and just find out who they are and just see life in a really gorgeous, curious way. It's it's so lovely. Honestly, he um <laughs> my little son is is very apt to just running up and hugging strangers. <laughs> and like obviously oh. at some point that has to stop. But how glorious that he just thinks that everyone in the world loves him. You know, like it's so beautiful. <laughs> he just thinks he just thinks that like everyone adores him. Like, you know, and I think that's just such a, a beautiful thing. He meets the world with optimism and openness and joy and I think that's very special yeah we were saying earlier about how when we know that when we have kids that we're not going to be able to sleep we know that all those other physical things or whatever that is going to happen but again the relationship side of stuff you two went through a rocky patch when once he'd arrived and and you know whether that's led by the lack of sleep the the change in your relationship not quite knowing you know where you are I found it a really refreshing part of the book actually because you also talk about you know don't touch me don't you know don't look at me like all that thing of it's just another ask or what and and at some point you can end up in on such different pages yeah I mean I write in the book that we we looked for the worst in each other and we found it you know like we were so at the end of our tethers we were exhausted as it turned out I was actually like very very ill mm-hmm. but I didn't know it like physically ill um we were sure I mean we loved our little boy so much you know like of course yeah. but like it was it was grinding and exhausting and you know bewildering and we'd never done it before and so you I think like you have a choice with your partner right like you can definitely like appreciate all the things that are amazing about them but if you want to, you can also be like, well, this isn't quite right. And, <laughs> and why didn't you do this? And I remember when you did this. And so we definitely, we both started doing that. And then it became like a sort of spiral. Um, and it was really alien to us because yeah. we'd only ever been like super, Deeply super. Deeply in love with yeah, each other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so we d- we also didn't know how to deal with it. You know, that was the other thing. Like we were tackling sort of issues that we'd never really dealt with before. Was it a difficult thing to even broach in terms of talking about it? Because... Were you scared of going there, of kind of going, this, something's not right, but in case, you know, it turned into a, well, let's not be together? Because I know it was on the cusp of that and there were separate yeah. beds and yeah, bedrooms yeah. and stuff. Um, unfortunately, I, I wish I had that mechanism where I could say, let's hold some of this in. Yeah. <laughs> but I do not have it. I'm more like, I'm feeling this at this exact same moment and you're going to know about it immediately, um, whether or not it's accurate or or rational. or um, So, no, I mean, it was, I think actually what happened was that we were just, we just knew that something wasn't quite right yeah. and that we were going to have to, and actually what, what it was, I think, was that we, we needed to support each other a lot more and also that I was actually really unwell but we didn't know so a lot of the roles that we'd adopted so mm-hmm. I was working as a full-time mum he was a stay-at-home dad um, and um, a lot of the roles we'd adopted a lot of I just wasn't able to do but I wasn't quite able to articulate why I wasn't able to um, and so it really got to the stage where you know we were drawing up a spreadsheet to divide our finances yeah. which I think is like you know, which now, like, you know, years down the line is unthinkable. <laughs> I can't <laughs> even tell you. We're back to being disgusting again. But it was so close, you know, yeah. and it was really just because I think we just we had to learn the the tools of communication to deal with a whole different sort of life, you know. Yeah. I wonder if part of that is also not being scared to let your relationship evolve and to and to find a new way of communicating with each other and, and knowing that that's all right that that's part of you evolving as a, as a couple 
and not being not being afraid of of that change not being afraid of conflict as well I mean I would say we're both quite conflict averse as as people you know like he's like one of the reasons I love him is he's like the most calm gentleman (laughs) you could ever wish to meet I am because of my background very averse to any sort of conflict especially in the home Mm -hmm. within the family or within loving relationships so I think yet learning to have conflict and ride it and communicate about it and you know maybe even feel a little grumpy with each other sometimes you know these were and you know I'm really glad that we were able to like work through that you know and get to a point where um we could have those moments and have those conflicts and then you know still cuddle up at night and be like you know you annoyed me today but I love you you (laughs) I know you touched on your health then I know that uh, when it, once it, when it started, you didn't quite know what was going on, but you just knew that you know you weren't breathing in the right way, and that things were hitting you physically harder than they had before. Yeah, so I basically, you know, like I think after you've had a baby, first of all, you stop thinking about yourself at yeah. all. You know, like even shaving your legs is like a, a sort of like a, an annual treat. So, so there was definitely like a a, a sort of a lapse in my own sort of attention to myself. Yeah. But I basically couldn't breathe very well. And I was like, well, you know, it's probably pregnancy weight or, Things you know. Things have moved. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like I, I carried an, a massive baby inside yeah. me, um, you know, or, um, you know, I'm just sort of out of shape because I spent, you know, 40 weeks lying on my side watching <laughs> one born every minute, um, eating crisp. Um, so, so, yeah, so basically, and then, but then slowly, it just got worse, you know, like, so I'd kind of whistle and, you know, I'd climb a hill and I couldn't breathe. And my husband would be like, are you okay? And I'm like, you know, I was literally like, um, and also I was just so tired. And yeah. of course, like, and you expect to be tired with a newborn. But by the time he got to sort of like one, I was still, you know, like I was finding it hard to get out of bed. I was hard, finding it hard to keep my head up. And so I went to a doctor and he was like, oh, well, it's it's asthma off you go, you know. Um, which, listen, like, so the condition I have is called um, idiopathic syphilitic stenosis. And it's basically where skin grows progressively in your windpipe, closing it up. Um, it's a one in 500,000 illness and it's idiopathic. So nobody knows why it happens. Yeah. They think it might be related to autoimmune issues or hormones, which is why it's often triggered by pregnancy. Um, but... I mean, the amount of women who are misdiagnosed as having asthma um, or just being overweight or just being anxious is astounding. And it's no surprise, right? Because well, your windpipe had got to six millimetres. Six millimetres, yeah. I mean, it was really, I mean, I was really, well, I'd actually had to really push. Like, I basically, I just, I just knew I was so ill, you know, like I couldn't get out of bed. I used to, like, summon myself to have breakfast with my little boy. So I'd, like, lie with my head on the table and chat to him and sing to him. And then I'd do the, the nighttime bath with him and I'd lie with my chin on the bath and chat to him there. And, like, basically that was all of my, and otherwise, like, some days I could get down to the local cafe if my husband, like, basically carried me. Look, carried me, but, you know, helped yeah. me out. It was just, it was just really I mean, serious. what did this do to you mentally? Never mind physically, being told it's asthma and being sent on your way. I'm guessing with an in, in with an inhaler, and you kind of go well. That this isn't really touching the sides. Like I don't. Well, do you know, I was lucky that I went to see um, a very good um, immunologist, um, and she she basically said I don't think this is asthma, but she thought it was something else, right? Which is incurable. Um, so for a while, I thought I was going to be like wheeling around an oxygen tank <laughs> every time I want to go out for a walk, you know. And so, and then for a while, they thought it might be a tumor, and so I had like you know I had to go out to this like you know private CAT scan place yeah. by a Westfield outside of Prague, and um, so it was really. What I will say is that actually, funnily enough, it actually really united me and my husband, you know, like we were still, well, you know, we were still like definitely feeling the bruises from like all the difficulties we'd had. And then, but he was just so steadfast, you know, like he was just like, I was like, oh God, like you didn't, you know, there's, I write about in the book, but there's research that says that like men, if they're faced with a partner who has a chronic illness or a, or a fatal illness will almost always leave not all of them but the largest proportion whereas women will almost always stay and you know because men are basically like I didn't sign up for this and I said to my husband like oh you didn't sign up for this and he's like listen even at two percent you're sparkier than most people at 110 percent (laughs) you know and I was just like oh god like this is 
you know what what an amazing man he loves you yeah no I mean it's just it was just but I really think like those are the things that really test your marriage yeah you know like parenthood and also if you're, talk, if you're talking and, about yeah illness is it a tumour is it life threatening you know when suddenly that's a very big thing yeah am I going to be in bed for 90% of the time for the rest of my life yeah and all know? of a sudden someone you know leaving wet towels on the bed it doesn't really matter no I mean this is it totally drew so many things into perspective um, but anyway so when they found out what it was they were like we need to get you into surgery straight away um, and so I had an emergency surgery on my throat um, and so then they basically they dilate uh, your windpipe so with me they did it with a laser um, and you know it worked beautifully like it was astounding to realise that I hadn't been breathing properly yeah. I watched a video that I'd done for the Royal Society of Literature and I'm literally why did no one tell me I was whistling like a like a tin, like a tin whistle you know like I was <laughs> doing my t- and I was like was no one like what's going on with Carrie like but um, so it did work and that was good but obviously like it's, it's a chronic illness so the, the, it kind of continues um, but is that I will, an operation that's going to have to be repeated then? Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky. I've only had two so far in the last three years. Some women have it like, some women literally have a dilation every few months. So, and it's, it's you know, it's a general anaesthetic operation. So, you know, um, and there are like, there are, you can get it resection. So you can take quite symbolic, I think, a piece of your rib and make a new windpipe with it is one of the treatments. Wow. But um, but basically it is like it's a, it's an ongoing condition um, and some women are luckier and go years without dilation. Some women have it more frequently. Nobody knows why because it's a woman's issue so the funding for the research is very low. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess like what, what I try and tell people now is if your doctor is telling you asthma but you still can't breathe even with an inhaler, Go to an ENT, ask to see an ENT, get them to scope below your below your windpipe so that you can actually see if if it's subglottic stenosis. Because also, um, you know, it's just still so undiagnosed. So Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and throughout all of that, you're trying to parent a one year old. How it must have had a massive impact. And it must have made you feel well. Quite, like it just wasn't how you thought motherhood was going to be. You know, you picture yourself running around after your toddler, and you simply can't do that. Yeah, I mean that was that was really hard. You know, like I'd already sort of been through the <laughs> the barriers of being like, well, will I be a good mum? I think I'll be a good mum. You know, like other people say I won't, but my friends say I will. And then I'd had to, and then you know, and then all of a sudden I was just not the mum that I wanted to be for my little boy. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I'm really lucky that Peter was. Is, is just an amazing dad. I always knew that Peter was giving our little boy like loads of love and loads of care and loads of joy in his life. Mm. And I also knew that I was, luckily he was a little bit too young to understand, which yeah. I think at the time felt very frustrating because I couldn't explain why like mummy was away for a week in hospital. Um, but actually now I'm really glad because I don't think he's ever going to remember that I was ever ill. You know, I have a really good autoimmune medicine, which seems to work very well yeah um and has given me sort of a whole new lease of life um and so I don't think he's ever going to remember me being ill but I have been able to like have this whole new appreciation and lease of life that I then I feel like I'm passing on to him too you know like I just feel this new joy I was a very anxious person definitely before the illness and that has pretty much gone away because once you've almost died you care very little about most things you know isn't it crazy though so it has to be you going to the the part of the worst that can happen to be able to appreciate everything that you've got and to be able to live your life. Yeah, and it's such a cliche, right? You're like, yeah. well, I, well, I almost died. And but it's a cl- cliche, no. it's a cliche because, <laughs> because they're true. You know, they carry so much truth. I, I really, I, you know, I, I honestly never go a day where I'm healthy and I'm not like, this is the best day I've ever had. You know, whether I'm going to Tesco's or whether I'm going to Tokyo. <laughs> so, um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I really think that that, again, I mean, you know, like... Uh, as I say, like a lot of the book is really about finding those moments of joy or the value in mm. really hard things, I think, which I think I learned as a coping mechanism when I was a child, uh, you know, to be able to survive my childhood, um, which has stood me in really good stead as an adult. Yeah. One thing you two, you and Peter, do not shy away from is travel. Yes. You have still <laughs> travelled so much. You know, and I think when you, you know, before having your son, thinking into the future, thinking about how things might change, how that might stop certain aspects of your life, travel is simply not one of those things. 
Yeah, I mean, and we mourned it, you know, like I, I'd been traveling like really consistently for about 10 years. Um, Peter loves traveling as well. He grew up in Switzerland. So, you know, like he always, he went to international school. Um, but I just, I really knew that I wanted that to be part of our lives. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there was lockdown, so we couldn't go anywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just such a good thing to give to your child. Like, I think there's definitely a balance between giving them stability. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my, my little boy loves routine like yeah. he does. You know, he loves his nursery. <laughs> he loves his he loves his breakfast. Uh, you know, his particular breakfast, his particular order. And he loves all that stuff. But then also, like, we took him for we just took him for a month to Japan where he, like, canoed on the lake by Mount Fuji as the sun rose. <laughs> and, you know, ran about the streets of Tokyo and... You know, like, and I think that he's 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 just learning so much about the world and yeah. about broader cultures and all the things that I loved about traveling, which is like, you know, the excitement and the newness and the discovery I now get to do with my kid, which is amazing. Like watching him eat his first slurp of noodles or <laughs> learning how to say thank you in Japanese is just like and, you know, people responding to that is just you know, amazing. So it's definitely different traveling with a kid. Like you can't yeah. deny that. You, yeah. We know every great play park in Tokyo and that is not something I ever expected. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're looking for different things yeah. when you travel now. Exactly. You know, every great soft play, I come for me to come to me for recommendations. I can give you like the best toddler list for Tokyo ever. And that's kind of not how it would have been before. But it's it's a different sort of travel, you know, it's richer. It's kind of like life, you know, like yeah. Things do change, but I feel like it's 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 got a, a different sort of richness to it, a different, um, the curiosity is different, the discovery is different. We keep travelling as much as possible, and I'm really lucky that my, my job kind of facilitates yeah. that. So I feel like there's a lot of scaremongering when it comes to travelling with children, and whether that's just from people that don't want kids on their flights or, or what. But, I, you know, there is so much joy to be had within it that it isn't something that people should be scared of doing. Yeah, I mean, listen, there will definitely be an hour a day where you wish you were at home, you know, <laughs> <laughs> with some Dairy Dunkers and some CBBs and, you know, <laughs> a, a room to escape to. But then also there's like, you know, the other eight hours of the day where you're seeing your kids like do something remarkable that you they would never have been able to do. Or they're making a new friend in like, you know, a play park and, you know, without any language, like somehow managing to converse with them or, you know, trying a new food or whatever it is. And that makes it all worth it. I mean, I think it's definitely tiring. I would I would yeah. never say otherwise. But I think the joy is so worth it. If you could write a letter on motherhood to anyone uh, about any part of it, who would it be to and what would you say? Um, I would probably write it to my son. Well, I mean, in fact, you know, one of the things about newborn that I say is that so halfway through I got very sick. And so the book, which was really meant to be like a book about motherhood and just things that I want to explore about what I was going through, really very selfish, <laughs> um, became this like love letter to my son. So yeah. it became like a, you know, me letting him know what joy and beauty and magic he like brought into my life by by being my son. Um, so I guess I've written the letter and it, <laughs> and it was newborn, but that's what I would do. I would let him know, you know, just just how magic it is being, being his mum. And how special it is to see this human grow in front of you and do something miraculous like literally every single day, you know. What would you say to anyone who was who had a childhood like you did and is is worried about the future and what, you know, becoming a parent and is consumed by what you were told, the notion of not being able to be a good parent. What would you say to them? I'd say you know, you know yourself, yeah. <laughs> you know, your close friends know you, um, you know, and I, I'd hope that anyone who's getting to the point of coming from a background like I have, who's thinking about having a child, will also have realised that so many of the things that happened to them were nothing to do with them. Yeah. You know, this is this is systemic inequality. Um, and if you have survived that, if you have thrived, you know, even if you're you've just managed to like scrape through, you have the most wonderful um, spectrum of skills and qualities to offer a child and to bring to motherhood. Um, and there's real, there's real, real value in the experiences that you've been through and, you know, in being able to, to sort of, you know, pass them on through motherhood. Yeah. Yeah. And not being scared of it and knowing that you've got so much, so much positive within you as well.
Yeah, I mean, you're as prepared as anyone else. And if not, maybe even a little more prepared because you know how to face the hard things. You know how to la- yeah. laugh at the darkest moments. You know, you, you know what it is to struggle and you also know what it is to move beyond that struggle. So you're as prepared as any other mother is, which is honestly for all of us, not very much. But, you know, you learn on the job. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I think that is such a refreshing moment, a refreshing thought when you realise that no one actually knows what they're doing at all. Mm hmm. We're all just making it up. <laughs> Winging it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we end the, end the podcast with you completing three sentences. The first one is being a mum means. Uh, just a little bit of joy every day. Since having a child, I... Drink less martinis. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm working at my quota now. He's three again. Don't worry. <laughs> and I'm happy when... Uh, when the family is together having breakfast, actually, that is my best part of the day is when we're all kind of sleepy and the dog's running around trying to steal food and the cat's meowing for food and my little boy's chattering away about something. <laughs> and I'm just like, that is, this is, this is it, you know, like this is, this is the best thing. Yeah. I love that. Kerry, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you.